not standing up here since I'm probably the only person in the Army Heritage and Education Center who is not a student of Dr. Gray Irwin. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, everyone has a handout, I see, so I won't, I won't go through too many of the conventions, except I'll say that uh, Dr. Irwin's been a great friend of this organization, of the War College, and a great contributor, and uh, widely published. His works on Custer, to his works on World War II, to his wonderful history that uh, all of us material culture people love, illustrated history of the United States Army, which is available in the, in the back of the room, as are many of his works. Uh, tonight he's going to talk to us about one of my favorite campaigns. We all know the story of how the Virginia campaign ends in 1781, and he's going to put a new slam on, us, on this campaign for us. We're talking about the Battle of Green Springs and some of the story moments of the 1781 Virginia campaign. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Greg Well, as you uh, gathered from the squeal, I'm miked, so everyone can hear me all right? You may not be so happy about that once I get started. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor uh, to uh, play a small part in uh, the proud tradition uh, that's been established by AHEC, and I, uh, I've been cherishing every moment of this, and I hope that uh, the rest of you have half as much fun as I've had so far. Uh, we'll be looking at a uh, uh, familiar story uh, but uh, hopefully uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a novel way. Um, I hope that this uh, presentation is a reminder of the importance of uh, considering uh, cultural and social factors in evaluating uh, military operations, and I guess uh, one should say in planning military operations, because they have as uh, important an impact as the number of boots on the ground and where those boots go a walking. Nearly every school child oh good, in the United States has heard of the siege of Yorktown. It was the decisive battle that all but ended the military phase of the American Revolution and guaranteed the 13 colonies independence. Yorktown stands as George Washington's finest hour as a general and the crowning achievement of his ragged continental army. It was also the event that assured Charles Earl Cornwallis an undeserved place on history's list of famous losers, just as it provided Americans with an exaggerated view of their martial prowess. At the ceremonies marking the bicentennial of that pivotal event in October 1981, President Ronald Reagan echoed the exultation felt by patriots of Washington's day when he called Yorktown, quote, a victory for the right of self-determination. It was and is the affirmation that freedom will eventually triumph over tyranny, end quote. Few Americans would quarrel with Reagan's words. History, however, is a matter of perceptions, and sometimes those perceptions are too narrow. Such is the case with Yorktown. American scholars are generally so intent on memorializing Washington's brilliant generalship during the Yorktown campaign that they ignore how close Cornwallis came to subduing Virginia. They also fail to see that there was a dark side to Washington's celebrated triumph. Yorktown meant liberty and independence for the majority of the young republic's white citizens, but it signified something else for the 500,000 blacks who lived in the United States in 1781. For African Americans, Yorktown meant another 80 years of chattel slavery. And for most of the 30,000 freedom-loving blacks who cast their lot with the British and joined Cornwallis in the summer of 1781, Yorktown became not merely the graveyard of their hopes, but of their mortal remains. It seems unfair to say that the British lost the Revolutionary War because they never really quite realized what they were up against. To George III and his advisors, the rebellion was a plot hatched by an evil minority, opportunistic demagogues who deluded the riffraff of the 13 colonies into, into opposing lawful government. The British sincerely believed that most upstanding Americans remained loyal to their king. All that was required to quell the uprising was a show of force to discredit rebel leaders and frighten America's masses into resuming their proper allegiance. 
Since the British were out to win hearts and minds, they usually did not treat Americans with the same cruelty they reserved for rebels in Catholic Ireland or the Scottish Highlands. Unrestrained barbarism would cost the Crown potential American supporters and even alienate committed loyalists. As the British were so sure the revolution had no legitimate appeal, they did not act with the energy and possibly the ruthlessness that the situation warranted. The British set the basic pattern of the War of Independence during the 1776 campaign in New York and New Jersey. Whenever one of the king's generals wished to conquer a colony, he would head for its largest port, defeat whatever American army stood in his way, occupy his objective, establish a network of outlying outposts, and then wait for the rebel cause to come unglued. That did not happen. The beaten continental forces would simply retire beyond easy reach, recruit themselves up to strength, and then take positions that threatened the enemy's smaller and more isolated outposts with sudden ca capture. At the same time, inflamed local militia harassed British garrisons and foraging parties, giving the occupiers no rest and depriving them of any sense of security. Forced to concentrate to avoid defeat in detail, the British found themselves confined to a few major towns and living under virtual siege. With the rebels controlling the countryside, loyalists found it impossible to rise in decisive numbers. Any Tory who openly declared for the king risked the loss of his property, imprisonment, and possibly death. Rather than chant such perils, many loyalists adopted a wait-and-see attitude. If the king's regulars were victorious, royal subjects would lose nothing by their silence while the issue teetered in the balance. To break the stalemate that came to characterize the American war, royal commanders seized more cities, but that strategy gained them nothing except worthless real estate. When the British army tried to divide the colonies by marching down the Hudson in 1777, it was trapped and forced to surrender at Saratoga. That stunning rebel victory brought France into the war on the side of the United States, and Spain and the Netherlands soon followed suit. Britain now faced a world war, and it strained its military resources to the limit while endeavoring to safeguard a far-flung empire. Assured that vast numbers of loyalists inhabited the South, the British decided to ship their operations to Georgia and the Carolinas. In May 1780, General Sir Henry Clinton, the Commander-in-Chief of His Majesty's Forces in North America, captured Charleston, South Carolina, and more than 6,000 Patriot troops, whose commander had opted foolishly to defend the doomed port. Clinton soon returned to his main base at New York City, leaving Lieutenant General Charles Earl Cornwallis and 8,000 regulars to establish British rule in the Carolinas. Cornwallis was a robust 41 years of age when he assumed this important command. He carried himself with the easy self-assurance that sprang from an aristocratic background and 23 years of military experience. The Earl had been fighting the American rebels since 1776, and he was esteemed as one of the king's ablest and most aggressive generals. At the outset, Cornwallis' mission in the Carolinas seemed easy. The capture of an entire Continental Army at Charleston left local patriots demoralized and vulnerable. As the British advanced inland, the rebels either fled or switched their allegiance to the crown. Magnanimous in victory, Cornwallis permitted them to take an oath of loyalty and join his loyalist militia. Then in the summer of 1780, the Continental Congress sent a new rebel army to reclaim South Carolina. Though badly outnumbered, Cornwallis crushed this threat at the Battle of Camden, August 16, 1780. Um, little diagram showing the battle there in the, in the upper, upper center, which is probably too small to, to be seen, uh, but uh, I made the effort. Um, so uh, Cornwallis uh, crushes uh, this rebel effort at the Battle of, of Camden um, uh, on August 16, 1780, but his victory had a bittersweet taste. At the approach of the Continental troops, the crypto rebels of South Carolina turned on the British. Whole units of loyal militia took the arms and equipment that they had drawn from royal magazines and defected to the guerrilla bands assembling in the swamps around Charleston. Later in the year, Cornwallis confronted a second American army under a neighbor foe, Major General Nathaniel Greene, Washington's most trusted lieutenant. Keeping just beyond reach, the wily Green goaded Cornwallis into launching a ruinous midwinter pursuit across barren North Carolina. 
One of the Earl's sergeants called the state a country thinly inhabited and abounding with swamps which afford every advantage to a partisan warfare over a large and regular army. Green led the Earl on a furious chase for nearly two months, finally pausing to fight at Guilford Courthouse on March 15, 1781. Green's forces outnumbered the British two to one, but Cornwallis gave battle anyway, and he defeated the rebels once more. Nevertheless, the outcome of the battle was indecisive, and the cost to the British appalling. Of the 1,900 redcoats, Hessians, and loyalists uh, that the Earl led into the fray, more than a quarter fell killed or wounded. Another 436 British soldiers suffered bouts of sickness as a result of this strenuous campaign. Before Cornwallis's ailing army recovered its strength, Green marched on South Carolina. This time, however, Cornwallis did not join Green in an exhausting game of cat and mouse. Years of hard campaigning in America had finally shown the Earl the flaws in Britain's fundamental strategy. For the rest of that spring, and well into the summer of 1781, before he received orders to entrench at Yorktown, Cornwallis would experiment with a new approach for subduing the rebels. Cornwallis's most significant realization was that most loyalists could not be trusted. Our experience has shown that their numbers are not so great as, as has been represented, he wrote ruefully from North Carolina, and that their friendship is only passive. The Crown's American supporters talked a good fight, but they usually deserted the royal cause at the first sign of trouble. The idea of our friends rising in any number and to any purpose totally failed as I expected, the Earl confided to a brother officer, and here I am getting rid of my wounded and refitting my troops at Wilmington. In reference to the handful of southern Tories who attached themselves to his battered army, Cornwallis described them as so timid and so stupid that I can get no intelligence. As for the troublesome Green, the Earl had learned that there were less expensive ways to deal with rebel armies than attacking them directly. Cornwallis would counter the threat to the Carolinas by striking at the American general's base of supply, the state of Virginia. Virginia was not only the largest and most populous of the rebellious colonies, but the richest as well. Virginia tobacco was a prime reason why America's staggering economy had not collapsed entirely. With the fall of Charleston, Virginia became the mainstay of the rebel war effort in the South. It provided the men and materiel Green needed to keep his army in the field. If Virginia could be knocked out of the war, perhaps the whole rebel confederation might come tumbling down. In a letter dated April 18, 1781, Cornwallis expressed his views in these words. If, therefore, it should appear to be the interest of Great Britain to maintain what she already possesses and to push the war in the southern provinces, I take the liberty of giving it as my opinion that a serious attempt upon Virginia would be the most solid plan because successful operations might not only be attended with important consequences there, but would tend to the security of South Carolina and ultimately to the submission of North Carolina. Virginia lay right for invasion in 1781. Like other Americans, its people were weary after six years of war. Almost all of the Old Dominion's continental regiments had been captured at Charleston. That left only a few half-trained regulars to defend the state. In addition, large drafts of the Virginia militia had been sent far from home to fight under Green. Those who survived the arduous campaigns in the Carolinas harbored no desire to face Cornwallis' redcoats again, a reluctance that they communicated to the militiamen who had stayed behind. Even nature favored the Earl's designs. The most distinctive feature of colonial Virginia's geography, which is obvious from this map, was Chesapeake Bay. With its network of great tidal rivers, the James, York, Rappahannock, Potomac, and Susquehanna, and other navigable streams, the Chesapeake served as the highway that brought the first permanent English settlers to North America. It shaped the pattern of Virginia society and became the key to the colony's prosperity. The, Ch the Chesapeake also offered an enemy, a ready-made invasion route, especially since its twisting 8,000-mile shoreline was indefensible. As long as the Royal Navy ruled the waves, there was hardly anything of importance in Virginia east of the Blue Ridge Mountains that could not be flattened by British broadsides or menaced by landing parties. Not a town, not a plantation, and not a tobacco warehouse was safe. As Cornwallis astutely observed, the rivers in Virginia are advantageous to an invading army. 
Having taken these facts into, into account, Lord Cornwallis began his march north toward the Old Dominion on April 25th, 1781. I jumped forward, I'm sorry about that one. Shows Cornwallis's route into Virginia. By May 20th, he was at Petersburg, near the center of the colony, where he joined forces with a small British army commanded by Brigadier General Benedict Arnold. Arnold, the famed American trader, now a British general, had opened operations in Virginia by raiding up the James River in January 1781 and his activities highlighted the Old Dominion's vulnerability to amphibious operations. Major General William Phillips joined Arnold a few months later with 2,000 reinforcements and assumed command of the combined force, only to die of typhoid fever at Petersburg a week before Cornwallis' arrival. After Cornwallis absorbed Phillips' expedition, he had 8,000 seasoned regulars at his disposal, and he proceeded to subject Virginia to the ravages of war. Two weeks after the junction of Cornwallis and Phillips, Virginian George Mason, a gentleman lawyer and a firm adherent of the rebel cause, wrote in New Despair, Our affairs have been for some time growing from bad to worse. The enemy's fleet commands our rivers and puts it in their power to remove their troops from place to place, where and when they please, without opposition so that no sooner that we collect a force sufficient to counteract them in one part of the country, but they shift to another, ravaging, plundering, and destroying everything before them. The enemy's capital object at this time seems to be Virginia. For the next four months, Cornwallis terrorized the patriots of Virginia with a new brand of war. One by one, he eliminated the mistaken assumptions that had hobbled the king's forces for the past six years. In their place, he introduced a simple but brutal strategy that strained Virginia's devotion to the cause of liberty. Less than a month after Cornwallis entered the Old Dominion, Richard Henry Lee, one of the leaders of the drive to declare American independence back in 1776, was sounding like a defeatist. We shall receive all the injury before aid is sent to us. What will become of these parts, heaven knows. We are in the power of the enemy. To that gloomy assessment, Lee added, Cornwallis is a scourge and a severe one he is. The doings of more than a year in the South are undoing very fast while they rush to throw ruin into the other parts. One of Cornwallis's most striking tactical departures was to cease putting his trust in the Loyalists. He no longer wasted his time courting unreliable allies. All he asked of those white Virginians who claimed to support George III was that they stay out of his way. This public warning, which Cornwallis posted in the waning days of his Virginia campaign, characterized his new approach. The inhabitants of Elizabeth City, York, and Warwick counties, being in the power of His Majesty's troops, are hereby ordered to repair to headquarters at Yorktown on or before the 20th day of August to deliver up their arms and to give their paroles, that they will not in future take any part against His Majesty's interest. And they are likewise directed to bring to market the provisions that they can spare for which they will be paid reasonable prices and ready money. And notice is hereby given that those who fail in complying with this order will be imprisoned when taken, and their corn and cattle will be seized for the use of the troops. Unlike other British commanders, Cornwallis kept his army on the move almost constantly. He did not just take cities and sit in them. From the experience I have had, the Earl reflected, and the dangers I have undergone, one maxim appears to me to be absolutely necessary for the safe and honorable conduct of this war, which is that we should have as few posts as possible, and that wherever the king's troops are, they should be in respectable force. By dint of frequent and rapid marches, Cornwallis kept the rebels off balance. He left his enemies no sanctuary where they could rally or stockpile arms. Cornwallis also made certain that Virginia citizens paid for their allegiance to the rebellion by suffering the horrors of war. He not only struck at the state's military capacity, but also at its citizens' purses. If Virginians wanted to defy royal authority, they would pay dearly for it. Cornwallis and his far-ranging army, uh, well, he had his far-ranging army destroy anything that might be of use to the Patriot War effort, including private property. The following order, which the Earl issued to his cavalry, typified this new strategy. All public stores of corn and provisions are to be burnt, 
And if there should be a quantity of provisions or corn collected at a private house, I would have you destroy it, as there is the greatest reason to apprehend that such provisions will be ultimately appropriated by the enemy to the use of General Greene's army, which, from the present state of the Carolinas, must depend on this province for its supplies. Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Torton, the commander of Cornwallis's cavalry, believed that to strike terror into the inhabitants of rebel districts was a point of duty. He boasted that he would carry the sword and fire through the land. Everywhere they went.